Welcome back to The Street. We're back for more Spirited Debate with David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group, joining us from the lovely Newport Beach. David, thanks for coming back, following on from that break. Now, I wanted to talk about some of your stock picks. So, just first, let's start with Lamar Advertising Codes, one that not a lot of people watching perhaps do know. And the question I ask you, because... Obviously, they've been incredibly acquisitive of late. They've been engaging in a lot of M&A, buying up a lot of billboards. But there's two ways, I suppose, of looking at it. One is that you could potentially be coming into, over the next 12 months, so just in terms of the timeline, that you see that macro conditions impact advertising. But at the same time, they could very well be beneficials of what we were just talking about in terms of the the political cycle and all of the political spend. So how how do you rationalise that? Yeah, the idea that a company like Lamar is extra opportunistic in a political cycle and then loses some of that when it ends is an uh, obvious fact that the market already knows. It's reflected in the stock price. The, the cyclicality of earnings for political spending was priced in a year ago, not a month ago. And yet, as you go to the next period, if there is indeed a recession and they have a cyclical downturn, then uh, advertising could be something that suffers. But I go back to the COVID moment where the entire highway system was shut down. The whole country was shut down. And you really only saw earnings contraction of about 10 to 15 percent. It was incredibly resilient. So this is a well-managed company with great assets, a strong balance sheet, and their acquisitive spree was cash-funded and has been accretive. They have not had to over-lever the company to do it, and we believe that there's a strong alignment with management and shareholders around dividend growth. Just just really quickly, in terms of their contracts, are they long-term with the advertiser, or is it just uh, they use uh, separate ad brokers? Because I'm just wondering as to the amount of revenue that they could get from each billboard if we do see that downturn, or is it a set, set figure, set price? It's a mix of all the above. It's a great question. They have some that are very short-term that can be real hot dollars, and they have some that are longer-term. So it's a very diversified revenue model. Okay, moving on, because Mollis & Co., in, I saw in your notes that you don't normally buy up all of these small companies, and I just heard you in the break uh, talking about some of the investment banks. So could you just lay out the thesis as to why, why Mollis instead of one of the, the larger firms? Well, again, we do own J.P. Morgan as a commercial bank that has a strong investment bank powerhouse, but they're, not, they're a balance sheet sensitive company, always have been, always will be. Mollus is really quite diversified from JP because Mollus doesn't need balance sheet capital for any of what they do. They're an advisory investment bank. And so the stock came down about 40% on the year as obviously M&A has really dried up and that gave us an entry point. So we brought, bought it on distress. We absolutely love their commitment to dividend growth. The fact that it is not a capital intensive business, they don't need a lot of balance sheet capital to give advice. And they are right now buying during a period of distress, meaning what do they buy? Talent. They're hiring top tier investment bankers from around the street. And we just think Molus is a wonderful business model. In terms of M&A, just, uh, I suppose, circle around one of the thematics that you're talking about in that thesis. Do you think that that's going to come back? Because we have seen a few smatterings of M&A over the course of the last couple of weeks or so. But obviously, when you have the tightening credit conditions, it perhaps causes people to press pause. But at the same time, you're going to have these incredibly attractive prices for companies that potentially could be in distress. So how do you figure the next, say, 12 to 24 months of M&A? Well, remember, I was a managing director at Morgan Stanley for many years, and the Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's have a very high threshold for the price point uh, of an enterprise value that, uh, that wets their whistle. A Molus is able to go downstream. They're able to do smaller type deals. And I think if you see M&A get kind of held up around real leveraged LBOs, big mega cap private equity deals, you're still going to have a lot of uh, more middle markets type transactions that take place. And this is a generational story. It's a secular story. There's a lot of privately held wealth that is looking to transact either in public markets or into a private equity transaction. 
action. And Mullis is one of the leaders. There's other publicly traded names in this space, too. Houlihan Loki is a great investment bank. But Mullis is the one with the high dividend yield and high commitment of returning capital to shareholders. And they have no debt on the balance sheet. So as cash flows come in, they're able to distribute. And if there is worse than we expect cyclical downturn, they can weather the storm without any debt. Uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a theme here, David, when it does come to low debt levels when it comes to these companies. But just finally, because we've only got time for one more, Simon Property Group, I suppose, obviously you're suggesting that you like the strong yield, but is there any risk moving forward, like I'm thinking in terms of uh, energy costs because of what the administration has been doing and the shortfalls that we've been having? Or is it, do you think they can weather the storm, they can weather the macro, they can weather all of these price pressures that are coming through? Well, I'm not sure where, what you mean by the energy price pressure to the Simon malls. Property as a mall operator. Off of the malls, because electricity costs and then being able to pass through those costs oh. to their end uh, users because you've oh. got a lot of pressure that are already on these businesses that have the rental leases with Simon Property. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. I think it's a very marginal effect to the P&L. You're right. They mostly pass on the impact of, of higher utility costs. And the, the, these tenants are in very solid leases. Again, their collection of rents back to the COVID moment, when literally the malls were shut down, uh, they still were collecting 94% of rents. And so I don't worry about them collecting rents. The risk with Simon is that they have added other things to their balance sheet. They bought J- J.C. Penney out of bankruptcy and they bought some uh, a, a fractional interest in some of their weaker tenants. And so on one hand, that could be upside surprise because they have a lot of leverage in sort of the workout of these brands. With J.C. Penney, it's entirely just repurposing the real estate. Um, and so th- there is some risk in that, but you have a great margin of safety in Simon Property right now. 7.5% dividend yield. Stock came back down. It's still up over 100% from the COVID moment, and yet um, I think is deeply undervalued relative to its earnings power and the lower leverage they have in their debt profile. David, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for making so much time. That was an absolute pleasure. That was David Bonson coming through there from the lovely, again, Newport Beach. Now.